Well, some of you may remember that uh, intro video from a series we did about a year ago called Get a Clue. And uh, those characters that we learned about each week are all based on a book written by our very special guests, Mylan and Kay Yurkovic. They're here today, and uh, Mylan is an ordained minister as well as a pastoral counselor who has uh, dedicated his life to helping families and couples for over 30 years. Kay is a licensed therapist specializing in parenting and marriage relationships as well as being a a very popular speaker and lecturer. They've been married since 1972. They have four children, and when they're not uh, busy writing and speaking and traveling to Cincinnati for our benefit, uh, they get to enjoy 10 grandkids. Uh, They are the uh, co-authors of the book, How We Love, and they are here this morning and also this evening for family night. So can we please give a warm horizon welcome to uh, Mylon and Kay. Thank you, Kenny. Thanks, Kenny. Oops. I have guitars at home uh, in my room. I have my own guitars, but I don't know how to play like Kenny yeah, does. And so that's he's my, amazing. my dream that I can learn to play that well. And great to see all of you. We're very delighted to be with you today and tonight. And we hope you can join us uh, this evening as well for family night. You know... Um, We have been in Cincinnati several times, and we love this place, this location. It's a great town. Um, And but in here in Ohio, you guys have the same challenges we do. That is, we're told to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind, and then we're also told to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it is hard to do that. Sometimes it's easier to love God who we cannot see and who doesn't provoke us per se. And it's harder to love somebody who we can see and who is provocative to us or causes reactivity to us. And so that's what we're going to talk about. How do we learn to love better? Uh, Additionally, you know, Kay, uh, especially when we're stressed, we don't love as well. And so that's why today we're talking about, and there are bulletin notes if you want to take notes, learning to take stress and turn that into an opportunity for intimacy with those around you. And between this morning and this evening, we're going to be doing that. Um, Kate, give us a little bit of an exercise to get us going. Well, a lot of what we're going to share with you was an answer to prayer that we prayed at the 15-year mark of our marriage We had a core pattern, like many of you do who are married, that's just that tenacious dance that's no fun that goes over and over again. And we we said, Lord, what's at the root of this? We just are having trouble really shifting this. And one of the things he did was bring this information to us that was transformative. So, um, But stress is, we all have a stress response. We all do something when we're stressed. And... uh, You know, some of us know what that is, and some of us, it's more undefined. But really, when you think back to your family growing up, the first managers of your stress were your parents. You know, a parent manages a baby's stress when they cry, and then a toddler's stress. And if things are going well, they manage that stress by asking about feelings and emotions and comforting that child. So I want you to just think a minute. What did your mom do when she was stressed? Now, don't say it out loud. Especially if she's here. Think that. But just ask yourself that, what, what did your mom do? And then how about your dad? What did he do? What, was, what did you observe with what to do with difficult emotions or a bad mood? And then we want to take that down to a personal level and say, what did you do this week when you were stressed? Because every week has some sort of stress in it. Maybe on the way here today. Maybe it was a disagreement with your spouse. But... Think of something that stressed you, and then I want you to try and identify at least a couple feelings that you think you had because of that stressor. Now, some of us never think about this question. We never really link an event to feelings, and some of you know exactly what you felt. And then the third question is, what was your behavior because of that stress? You know, when we're stressed, we need relief. How did you get relief? Did you get relief? What did you actually do with those emotions and those reactions inside of you? And these are very diagnostic questions that we want to just get you thinking uh, because we all have very similar responses, uh, usually from time to time when we get stressed. 
And we need to ask the question, what did I do with that relief? Usually, I'm sorry, that stress. How did I get relief? And oftentimes the way we get relief is damaging to relationships. Uh, some people blow their stack and uh, when they get stressed. And I'd be less stressed, Todd, if you'd turn the countdown clock on so I know how much time I got. <laughs> uh, back, back there. I need the count clock. Yeah, thank you. I'll be less stressed. Thank you. So, or we can ask, or we can just ask for what it is we want, okay? And you could take five minutes off because we've already used five minutes if you want. <laughs> I'm just saying. Anyhow, uh, the ability, what I do with it, because it's often destructive, right. you know, or even when we isolate, that's destructive because it, it, people don't know what's going on. So, how did Jesus manage stress? Let's take a look at him. This is the model we want to learn to follow. Uh, Jesus one day died on a cross. And he died on this cross to pay for our sins. He was perfect, unblemished, without sin. And the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become righteous because of him. And so he died on a cross. Now it was a very grisly affair. He was beaten beyond recognition. He was detested. Uh, He was mocked. He was persecuted. And then they hung him on a cross until he passed away. The night before that, he knew this next day was coming. This was not news to him. He knew this. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. This was all in God's mind way before it ever happened. Nonetheless, Jesus, God who became flesh for 33 years, was all man and yet he was also 100% God. I don't know how to explain that. I just know that the Bible says that. And as a man, he had feelings. And as a man, he knew he was going to die the next day on the cross, and it was super stressful to him. And I'm going to start reading out of the book of Matthew in chapter 26, verse 36, and it says this. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, which is a, a garden, if you will, outside of Jerusalem. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And then he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Who were that? Who were they? That was James and John. So he took Peter, James, and John closer to him, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. When you're stressed, or I'm stressed, or you're stressed, we typically have a stress response. Everybody does something differently. But you know that that person is stressed because you've seen that look on their face, you've seen that body language, you've heard the sighs, the groans, or you've heard the total silence or you've heard the protest. That's a stress response that the person has. And it says here that Jesus began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Think of a sorrowful person, what they look like in your mind. Think of a distressed person, what do they look like? Imagine their their brow is furrowed, they're they're pacing, they're breathing heavily. Uh, He might be kicking the dirt. He's wandering back and forth. He's looking up at the sky. His arms are waving around. He's stressed. He's sorrowful and distressed. He didn't leave it to Peter, James, and John to try to figure out what was going on. He opened his mouth and proactively said the following. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. The word soul is a Greek word, suke, P-S-U-C-H-E, and we get the word psychology from it. It means the inner self, the inner person, the person on the inside, the feelings, the emotions. My soul is distressed to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. So he has this awareness of what's happening inside of him. He's able to then proactively share it with the people around and ask for something. Don't leave me alone, he says. I don't want to be by myself right now. And then it says he went on a little bit further, just a few steps away, and he prayed and fell on his face and he said, Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And so there's this tension between human life and faith. He's struggling emotionally with what's about ready to happen and the pain of the next day. And he says, now, God, is there another way to do this? 
But then ultimately he bends a knee and he says, nevertheless, what you say will go. And that's where faith comes in. This was a very unpleasant scene. It it already is a bit graphic, and I painted a graphic picture. But there are other passages in the Bible that talk about this evening. In the book of Hebrews, it says that, that Jesus, there was great loud wailing and tears. It was not a a subtle affair. He was literally crying out loud at the impending suffering he was going to have to suffer the next day going to the cross. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it says that he was so physiologically distressed that blood was coming through his pores and commingling with his blood, and so he's dripping bloody sweat on the outside. So this is a real scene, if you will. Very stressful moment. But what I learn about it is that he was aware of what was going on internally. He had safe friends with whom he could share horizontally and then vertically he could come to the Heavenly Father for help at a deep time of need. Three things that normally we all of us don't know how to do, he did. So, Kate, let's talk a little bit further about that. One of the things we um, ask early in our book is a question because it's very connected to what we do with stress, and that is, do you have a memory of comfort from when you were growing up with your parents or whoever raised you where you weren't okay, someone recognized that, they drew you out, they listened, they asked thoughtful questions, and maybe they hugged you, maybe they tried to find a solution that would be helpful for whatever you were going through. But you can say you left that experience feeling relief. Now, ideally, we should have a lot of these experiences, shouldn't we? And yet, many times when we ask this question, we find about 70% of the folks we talk to can't really come up with even one. And maybe 30% do have that kind of memory. If you do have that kind of memory then you learn something really important. You learn that people are a safe place to go when you're not okay. And that people are a safe place to help you out. And if you don't have those memories of comfort, then you learn that you're kind of on your own or you need to find out how to cope with stress and manage it non-relationally. We're either trained to go to people when we're not okay or we're trained that people aren't really going to be there for us, or they don't know how to really manage what we're feeling, or we don't feel safe enough to do that. And so we learn to manage it on our own. Now, there are some good ways to do that. Maybe prayer might be one, exercise might be one. Um, But if that's all you can do is non-relational relief, you're also very vulnerable to all the addictions that we have in our society. And addictions do a very good temporary job of providing relief. Um, either through high levels of distraction or through some sort of soothing. The trouble is they always have a price tag. But they, they do work for a, a short period of time, and so that's why people turn to them, because they don't know how and weren't trained how to really find a safe person to go to when they're not okay. So, evidently, Jesus, and again, he his... His family of origin was a little different than ours. He, he, he had for an eternity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in heaven, okay? And one day God became man and dwelt among us. So his family of origin, he had some advantages. I'll admit that. But he did have a human family called Mary and Joseph. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll learn about him at Christmas time. And, uh, and he had siblings. And so he had a, a, a normal family for his human existence. And there was stress even within that family. And he did have comfort, and he was able to begin to uh, show us, evidently as an adult, how to be self-aware, have others for support, and also have vertical support. So he's what we would call a secure attachment. The traits of a secure connector, we could take some of the characteristics we just saw just now in Jesus, and we could say those are some traits of a secure connector. We're going to go into this in more detail tonight at 6 o'clock. And, and actually show you a trait or a page that has traits of the secure connector on it so we can all look toward what are things and areas where we can grow. Kay and I had a lot of growing we had to do. Mm-hmm. 
uh, at the 15-year mark, we realized we were stuck in a core pattern. And we were frustrated, and we began to discover this and some other things, and we made some changes, and we've successfully made it to our 47th anniversary, so that's good news, okay? And uh, you don't have to applaud for that at all, um, or anything like that. You can, you can just sit and stare at us, and that's okay. Um, thank you. Uh, anyhow, uh, if we're not a secure attachment, we're one of the insecure attachment styles. Now, this isn't Mylon and Kay's little uh, belief system. This is based on 70 years of attachment research that began in, began in 1945 in, in England in World War II uh, as they saw children separated from their parents. And they began to study this. And so we're going to talk about the insecure attachment styles, the avoider, the pleaser, the vacillator, the controller, and the victim, some of the images you saw on this video from a year ago. And Kay is a former avoider. Now, this isn't about gender. This isn't about men and women. This is about your childhood experience. So it could be male or female. Kay happened to be the avoider. Stereotypically, we peg males as emotionally avoidant. And that's not accurate. In this particular case, Kay is a former avoider. Tell us what that person is like. Okay. Well, most of you who will fit this style come from a home that must be somewhat similar to mine in that my parents loved us. They just had no idea how to express or process anything emotional. If I cried in front of my dad, he said things like, you better stop crying. I'm going to give you something to cry about. And so I learned, oh, don't cry in front of him. Did any of you hear that one? Um, uh, my mom got highly anxious and flustered, like, I don't know what to do with you when you're sad. So over time, I learned not to show that emotion. And any emotion, really, uh, the only emotion really allowed in my family was anger, and that was only from my dad. Nobody else could be mad, just my dad. So when you really think back and ask yourself, you know, what did my family do with feelings? Uh, my family dismissed feelings. They ignored feelings. Um, there was no questions about what was internally going on on the inside. So I didn't even have a vocabulary to describe my inner person. And when I got married, I was like most avoiders. I was very independent. I was used to making my own decisions. I was used to ignoring stress or problems and just kind of having a motto of pull yourself up by the bootstraps. The trouble with that is if you don't know what you feel, you don't even know what you need. Because feelings and needs link together. If I'm sad, I need comfort. If I'm uh, angry, I need to problem solve or express what it is that's, that's bothering me. You know, if I'm... Uh, whatever feeling I am, I, it, it signals a need. It's kind of like lights on a dashboard. So for the avoider, their stress response is to detach or flee or move away from people when they're stressed. So avoiders will often isolate if they're stressed, even though they don't have words to tell you what it is that's going on. And if you're stressed or you're emotional, they're going to quickly try and fix it or just kind of move away because they don't know what to do with that. There was no training growing up in terms of what do I do with emotions. So if you ask an avoider how they are, how are you, what do they say? You're allowed to speak in church. Yeah. What do you think they say? Fine, right. That was always my answer, and it wasn't that I was lying. It was like, that's what I was trained to be, always fine. Don't need you, don't need you. I'm, I'm okay, I can cope it on, I can do it on my own. So avoiders fit that description, and it's something you just learn growing up. The problem is, is there's no ability to go to people. There's no thought as to what's on the inside or to take anything that's difficult to another person. That was just not even in my repertoire of behaviors or ideas or thoughts. So what was it like to be married to an avoider? Well, I'd like to take about a half hour and talk about that. <laughs> Luckily, you don't have half an hour. I don't only need a second to say it's hard to make contact with an avoidant person. Uh, if you're distressed, they kind of feel that vibe and kind of want to move away from you. In other words, they, they, it's hard for them to come close. Uh, characteristically, the avoider wants to move away from any signals of distress or neediness. And they're, so they're don't, they don't feel available. Uh, additionally, they don't, they don't have a lot of empathy for anybody else's pain. Um, they figure it out themselves. They, th they think you'll figure it out for yourself. Why do I need to go mm -hmm. over there? They'll just figure it out. 
And so there tends to be an isolation from that. Uh, Now, let's not confuse this also with the introvert. An introvert is someone who, an extrovert's introvert. An introvert is somebody who processes their thoughts internally. And so they think of the whole answer before they give you the final few words to answer your question. And so they're people of few words. Um, An extrovert, you ask them a question and they just start talking. And then they take you on the journey to give you the final answer. Okay, that's what an extrovert does. Avoiders, excuse me, introverts don't do that. They just give you the simple answer. Additionally, introverts need to be alone and quiet to recharge their batteries, and which is also meaning she needs to move away from people to recharge the battery. After today, Kay will want to just shut down for a period of time and recharge her battery. It's not a good time to talk, visit, or any of those kinds of things. She just needs to be quiet, and I understand that. A long time ago, it used to freak me out. Does that make sense? Oh, if I shake my head like this, you can say yes. It, it, under, does it make sense how it would freak me out? Yeah, it would, because she was always pe- feeling like she was pulling away. Now, I was a pleaser. Uh, Kay was an avoider. She's no longer an avoider. Tonight, we're going to share wh- with you the growth process that we went through so that we can grow out of these things and more resemble Jesus. I was a pleaser. A pleaser is the person who, like the person on the screen, looks absolutely desperate for you to smile at them. Please smile at me and approve of me. I desperately need you to be okay with me, because if you're okay with me, then I'm okay with me. That's that person up there on the screen, and that used to be me. My nickname used to be Smiling Mylan. Why? Because I smiled a lot to get you to smile, because if you smiled, then I'd be okay with me. If you're okay with me and you're smiling, then I could relax inside. When smiles went away in my home growing up, trouble was brewing. And therefore, smiles meant everything to me. If somebody smiled, I could relax as a little kid or as an adolescent. So it's really important to understand why this person is smiling. They're trying to engage you to get you to do something so they feel better. In other words, they're very other-dependent to have their view of self to be okay. So pleasers freeze if something stressful occurs and trouble occurs. Uh, They freeze and then after they unthaw for a second and they kind of figure out what's going on, they kind of scurry around to make everything okay. And so they will attempt to scurry around to make you happy and fix everything so you'll smile again because as soon as you smile again, they'll be okay. I sm- I'm no longer a pleaser and I smile when I want to now, you see. And I wanted to just then, <laughs> to smile. And when I don't, I don't smile because I don't need your approval to be okay with me. And we grew out of that place. So they scurry around, try to make everybody happy. They are the caretakers, the rescuers, the pleasers of this world to make everybody okay because they are very distressed when other people are not okay. Um, Kay, what's a vacillator? The vacillator is the third style, and the vacillator usually comes from a home where there is some connection, and it it's good. They love it. And they want more of that. The trouble is it's, it's very intermittent and it's more based on the mood of the parent than it is the need of the child. So this kid is kind of left waiting and wanting more than they're getting. Uh, in that waiting period, they can become frustrated. In some families, that's expressed very outwardly. In other families, it's internalized. Uh, but the vacillators distressed because there's just a scarcity of what they really want. So they deal with that pain by idealizing the future. And they're the kings and queens of romance, male or female. Um, They're the kings and queens of hope. Um, They are going to have the perfect family where there is no pain. Um, Idealism is really the the ability or the desire to have a pain-free life. If it's ideal, if I have the ideal marriage, the ideal kids, the ideal job, the ideal church, then there is no pain. The trouble is there is no ideal anything in this world. It's a very broken world. So the vacillator is often disappointed 
And in that disappointment, they're the protesters. While avoiders flee, pleasers get scared and freeze. Vacillators are the protesters. They'll tell you what they're unhappy about and why they're disappointed and what you should do differently and why you should do it differently. And that protest is a way of relieving a lot of anxiety. Why are they anxious? Because they're very sensitive and hypervigilant to distance and closeness. They're analyzing all their primary and important relationships. Are we good? Are we not? Are we close? Are we distant? And that increases anxiety. There are also a lot in their heads. We call it rehearsing and reviewing. Rehearsing is I'm thinking about this upcoming event or even maybe my husband coming home or maybe if I'm a male, going home. And they idealize what they want to happen in their own minds. And then the event occurs and then they review it, especially if it didn't happen as they anticipated and hoped. So there's a lot of assumptions and unspoken needs. If you ask a vacillator to ask directly for what they want, they don't like that because you should just know. If you just know, then it feels like love to them. But if I have to ask you for what I want, then it feels like it's not love anymore. So these are all childhood learnings that are brought into adulthood. And, you know, we say your marriage problems didn't start in your marriage. Um, your marriage is simply two attachment histories colliding that create a very predictable core pattern. Uh, but he was anxious before he ever met me. And I was detaching and distant before I ever met him. And uh, there's patterns of why we pick each other, but unfortunately we don't really have time to go into that. So would you add anything to that about the vacillator? Well, <clears throat> they are constantly, they're hypervigilant and they're constantly trying to analyze what's going on, which is this review and rehearse. But what they do is they attribute motives and intentions to the people that make them feel the way they feel. And so they'll tell you why you just did something, and uh, they'll tell you what the motives and the intentions were of that, which then puts the other person kind of on their heels because that hadn't crossed their mind, and so then that starts a chase scene. Um, we'll be explaining how to get out of that tonight, and I hope you want to come to that. But as a pleaser, Kay, I would stay in as a child. You know, our, our marriage issues preceded us, uh, our, our marriage. Um, if I thought something was going on in my home that wasn't good, I would stay in from playing and, and clean something, uh, dust the furniture or do something like that. Why did I do that? I was doing that so I could try to see what was going on and predict the outcomes of what was going to happen. And so um, I didn't realize that when I was stressed, I'd clean. And it wasn't a conscious thing to me. It was just something I naturally did. I just thought that's what I do. Do I have any fellow cleaners out there that when you're stressed, you clean? Come on, fess up. Raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you. There's a couple of you out there. And, uh, and, and they clean. I, I had a, we both have, uh, we have a counseling center our, as our day job. And uh, back in California, we have staff, 10, 12 people. And I remember... Uh, talking to one gal who, when she was stressed, she'd just, she'd look around, she'd look at a closet, and she'd just rip everything out of the closet and uh, rearrange everything. She said, I'm so exhausted, I, I've just been ripping closets apart all day. And uh, I said, so what's stressing you? And uh, what do you mean, what's stressing me? Well, that behavior, you didn't do that in an unstressed way manner. You did that because you were stressed. You had to do something. And so for a lot of us, cleaning or getting things structured and organized in our outside world help us, us soothe the internal world. So we make everything neat and tidy and get our P, you know, P-touch label maker out and we do all these things to get everything organized and we feel better. It's a way of self-soothing. So you didn't know why I would start ripping the garage apart on a Sunday night no. when I was exhausted. And it didn't make sense to you. you didn't just, make any you sense. In fact, say, well, it was why irritating. Are you doing that? Like, I mean, I like the garage clean, but now? And when I heard the childhood memories and where that all started, that irritation turned to compassion. It's like, mm. then I could say, when I saw him in, going into that behavior, oh, you're stressed. Let's go and talk and see what's underneath all this instead of just making it go away by cleaning and that provided connection versus disconnection. Sometimes she let me finish and then she'd say that. <laughs> Depends how late it was Just and what he was cleaning. It looks better when you get that done. 
But, but the bottom line is we had compassion for each other. When I saw a lonely little girl, seven years old, in my mind, sitting on her bed with nobody to talk to but a highly sensitive person and nobody asking her any questions, I suddenly saw my adult wife. I realized that there was a history that preceded my meeting her that was still alive and well. This last category we want to talk about for a moment is where the controller and the victim come in uh, that you saw on the video. And it is a home that they come from the same home. It's called the chaotic, disorganized home. Chaotic from the child's perspective. It's chaotic from the adult perspective too. But here's the child. I'm dependent upon these adults and yet they, are, they have addictions and they are abusive, and they are hurtful, and they are reactive. Sometimes they hurt me. Sometimes they neglect me. And life is dangerous for me. But I have no solutions. I have no way to go because I'm dependent upon them. They are, after all, my parents. So the child is stuck in an unsettled, dangerous place. You read about these kids just like like I do. Child Protective Services have to come in and take these children and try to protect them. That's where foster kids come from. And then we try to send in social services to try and help straighten out this home, and and it's really very difficult because this is a dangerous home. And often there is drug abuse, addiction, there's all kinds of things going on that the child is subjected to. Some of these kids, who are the more feisty ones, come out of that home and they've been right here in the down position with someone up here in the up position who has humiliated, shamed, embarrassed, ridiculed, and abused them. And they get strong enough, male or female, and they, have the, and they just go, boom, and they go to here. And they decide, I'm always going to be on top. I will always take control of my environment. Because if I know what's going on, then I'm never going to be surprised. I'm never going to be anxious. And so they get angry and protest just like the vacillator. But their anger and protest is for compliance. Just do what I say now. And so it's for compliance and control. And so these people are highly rigid. These people have lots of rules. Everybody is supposed to follow them because if you follow the rules, I won't be agitated and upset like I was as a child. They don't realize that their childhood experience is creating this way they manage life. But is this loving? You see, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Is this a loving way to live life? No. God tells us in Philippians 1 to let, let your love abound more and more. It should, get, it should be increasing like a, the, the, the fall Thanksgiving horn of plenty with lots of things coming out of it. And then it adds two words. In, in, in knowledge, real knowledge and all discernment. God wants us to be more knowledgeable about this thing called love and more discerning as to how properly execute things that will actually increase love, not divide and and separate people. That is our goal. And so what do we do if we're a controller? And so we are rigid and dominating. We have to learn to do something different. We're going to cover cover that tonight. But what's it like for the victim, Kay? The victim just comes from the same home. They're just the more sensitive, compliant kid who would hide in the closet versus ever fight the dominant parent. Mm. And the victim really learns as a little uh, girl or a little boy to tolerate the intolerable. Mm. And so often they pick a spouse that they just continue to do that. It's the intolerable has really become normal for them, which is why sometimes it's so hard to to leave an abusive relationship because it's really their normal. Mm. Um, The church really, you know, as we speak around the country, we know that the church is full of this people from really difficult homes. And I think God weeps for what they went through and draws them into his right. body for healing. But often we don't really realize that trauma has a very big impact on our adult life and how we function. And unlike the other styles, these kids are traumatized. Uh, in my home, it worked to be an avoider. It, everyone got along with no feelings a lot better. In his home... He had some impact on the parents by pleasing. In this home, really nothing works. 
So um, our, our heart really goes out to people who had, came from a home like this. Pleasers freeze, only it goes beyond what happens to the, um, the, the pleaser. They freeze and often numb out to the point where they're just not even fully present in the room. You mean they, the victim? But, I'm, the victim does, yes, sorry, when they're stressed. And again, this is a coping mechanism they used. Um, trauma affects the body physiologically, and many times as adults, our body will respond if we've had trauma before our mind even knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, sensitivity to voice tones, sensitivity to um, loud noises, anything that is a reminder of the chaos in the child at home. These exist on a continuum, all these styles, from a little bit to a lot. Many times people from, from these difficult homes say, well, I'm all of them, which makes sense because these are coping mechanisms to try and see what works. Um, we just say, if you came from a difficult home, um, pick the thing you think you do the most in the relationship that you most want to change. And uh, if you want to go on the website, howwelove.com. There's a quiz there that might help you discover just kind of where your starting point is for, for everyone. You know, there's two ways that the Bible says God wants us to learn to manage stress. The first one is, uh, it's actually taught in the book of Hebrews, that we're supposed to bring our stressed self to God for help. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, it says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. This is referring to Christ. Let us therefore draw near to the throne of grace that we might find help at a time of need. Now that that door is open 24-7, 365. Even on his birthday, Christmas, he doesn't shut that loading dock up or shut it down. You, You can back the dump truck up any time And, you know, let everything fall out before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm very stressed. I'm hurt. There's pain here. There's pain there. Please help. I don't know what to do. Give me wisdom to know how to manage this. Secondly, and that's always available. Secondly, the Bible says that there are these these commands again in the New Testament called the one another's of Scripture. What are we supposed to do one to another? Well, I just indicated this morning one of those. We're supposed to love one another. Well, what does love mean? It doesn't mean I'm supposed to have fond feelings for you. It means agape love means I'm supposed to do the right thing that will help you grow next kind of love. It doesn't have feelings as much as it has actions that are guided toward helping you get someplace with where you're at. Then it says to uh, bear one another's burdens. How can I bear your burden if you don't tell me that you're burdened at all? If you're just quiet and you just drift off someplace, I don't know your burden. But you would have to overcome shame and and lack of self-awareness and then have the courage to speak to me. And that was hard at the beginning Mm -hmm. for you and I to speak truthfully to one, one another, let alone ask for help. To ask for help is a difficult thing, but Jesus asked for help from Peter, James, and John and the Heavenly Father. The Bible says encourage one another. How can I encourage you if you don't tell me where you're discouraged? Do I tell you where I'm discouraged? There's supposed to be this whole horizontal working within the body of Christ, of Christ's followers, of mutual support that encourages and builds up and edifies or builds other people and yourself. And we're going to talk more about that tonight, these, these principles that will help us grow. But stress kind of exposes some things, doesn't it? Stress is a gift in a way because it does expose our weaknesses. It exposes where we need to grow. And it actually does give us an opportunity to connect to another human being in a really honest, vulnerable way. Of course, that's a learning curve. And it's uncomfortable. A lot of people don't grow because it's uncomfortable. And in closing, I just want to share a quick story about a couple that I worked with recently. He had a lot of trauma and um, really sad, some very sad childhood stories. And he had never shared these really with anyone because he didn't want sympathy. And I asked him to put his head on his wife's lap 
lay down on the couch and she sat on this end and he stretched out and put his head on her lap and I said, I want you to share with your wife one of your hardest childhood memories. And so he began to relate this story of a particularly hard and uh, abusive situation where he was told if you cry, you're going to get it worse. And so he wasn't even allowed to cry as he was being abused. And his wife started weeping. And she was so tender. She started stroking his head and she says, I just, I never knew this story. I can't believe you had to go through that. I'm so sorry. And then he began to have tears come out of his eyes. And at the end of that time, he just said, I've never ever told anybody a story from my childhood or seen them feel anything for me. And he said, I've never experienced any comfort. And he says, that was actually very comforting. So that was an example of uh, a couple that really had no idea how to bring themselves to each other, um, but they, they learned to do that as we worked together. So um, the great thing about this material is it really gets down to the root of where you struggle in relationships. And so we hope we'll, you'll come back tonight and we can share some more with you about um, how to change these things and experience um, a relationship and a marriage without a core pattern. And if you're single, please come too because there's going to be some benefit for you too. And if you come tonight, we will not ask you to put your head in somebody's lap. Yeah, we won't. <laughs> okay, because that, that's the kind of 201, 301, 401 level. We won't ask you to do that. But we're just going to be sharing with you things that absolutely transformed our relationship uh, some 30 years ago and still continues to do so. We work on this every day. This is not something that we, we just did once and never do it again. It's a daily habit of discipline. I'd like to close in prayer. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for this wonderful church here at Horizon Community Church. And uh, thank you for the privilege of being here and the great uh, group of people, the atmosphere, the loving uh, group that, and welcoming group. We just pray that you'd help us learn to love better. And we just ask for your kindness and grace to be able to do that. And we uh, just come before you and just pray that you would go before us. And those that are able to make it tonight, we pray for a blessed evening where we can all grow and realize change and experience that and, and new habits to follow to change some of these patterns. We put this before you and ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Can we thank them? Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Kay. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this morning. And uh, again, 6 to 7.30 uh, this evening, uh, they will be continuing in our family series, uh, How to Embrace the Heart of Your Spouse. And uh, we hope you'll uh, come join us tonight. And uh, we'll see you next week and have a great afternoon. Thanks for coming.